This design is so cool, you guys. You saw this functionality in a previous video of mine, but I have outdone myself with this one. I've simplified it down to just two components. It's a true flexure with no pivot points, and it functions flawlessly. It closes, holds the broom, and opens every single time without fail. I am absolutely in love with this silly little creation. So there's a famous uh, architect named Mies van der Rohe, and his famous words are less is more, and that's 100% the case with this. Simplifying it down to just the rigid component and the flexible component um, makes it deceptively simple. And there's a lot going on in actuality in this uh, flexible part here. And it took me quite a few days to develop this and to uh, figure out all of the forces and the balancing acts going on in the forces and all of that. Look, here's the uh, sort of sanitized stack of iterations that it took me to get here. You guys saw this stack in the last video. So uh, yeah, let me, let me just take you guys on the journey and show you the things that I had to figure out in order to make this creation. But uh, before we do that, I wanna tell you guys that I think I could get a patent on this now. Probably a 90% chance that I could get a utility patent uh, on this design because it's functionally different from all of the designs that are out there already which have a pivot point with these pins. So by turning it into a flexure, that's now patentable and um, I released this video instead. So now nobody can get a patent because this is gonna be considered prior art in the public sphere. Everybody, everybody has an awareness of this idea now. So why didn't I patent it? Well, I already have one languishing patent in my possession that's for my rotating buckle. Uh, and I actually own a bag company and I have inventory of my bags which use my buckles. So what am I gonna do with a broom holder? I don't own a broom factory, a broom, broom company. But if I did, this would be a fantastic value proposition to put this holder in the box with the broom. So anybody buying a broom now has a way to hold it to their wall. Uh, yeah, that seems like a no-brainer to me and it makes your brooms that much more competitive. Although, you know, like Libman, we bought this one because it was the one that was on the shelf at the grocery store. So their real competitive advantage is just uh, paying the grocery stores to put it in the most prominent, easy to find location in the store. So, uh, but if it was a more competitive environment, uh, this would be a nice touch to add. And yeah, it's ready for uh, the development process to change it from a 3D printed proof of concept. And this is just a really solid proof of concept at this point. And it needs to be changed quite substantially into something that's injection moldable. And you can see, I kind of started to go down that path with this where I hollowed out the, uh, the arms here in, in preparation for, for thinking along those lines. Not that I'm ever gonna develop this, although if you own a broom company and you wanna hire me, I definitely, I know what to do. Uh, to get this thing into production. But yeah, let me take you guys on the journey, uh, show you guys all the forces going on inside of this uh, flex flexible piece of TPU because it's super interesting. In the last video, this was the winner, the successful design that held the broom with enough friction so that the handle couldn't slide out and yet it would reset itself every time I tried to pull the broom handle out once in a while I could get a failure to reset. It's not good enough. There's always room for improvement. In this case, uh, even though I was very proud of the, uh, you know, the rigid pieces and how I was able to redesign them so that there was zero support material and they were optimized for strength, why do we have six pieces? Right? That's just too many components. And also, what about this band? Do we really need it to be there? But to make improvements, we really have to understand what's going on because even though this is a deceptively simple device with just sort of a rigid fork uh, two pivot points and a flexible thing, uh, there's a lot of very complicated and balanced forces uh, going on inside of the, 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 the green part here. So let's define uh, the components here so that we can dissect uh, all of the forces and, and understand what we need to do to redesign this part. This green part here I'm calling the gripper. These thickened portions that are poking off that way are called the arms. The arms have two springs on them. There's the main springs, that's the ones on the inside here, and then there's the front springs. Those are the ones here on the outside. And we're just basically considering these edges to be springs because internally we have um, you know, many walls printed. I think there's three walls here. So the, um, the walls are acting you know, they're providing much more force than the hollow infill in between. So that's why I'm differentiating between the, the mainspring and the front spring. But really, the whole arm as a unit, whole, is kind of a spring. It's just that it has, you know, sort of an inner and an outer face. 
This flat portion across the middle here, I'm calling the hammock. And of course we have the two pivot points and the fork. This tool is a stand-in for the broom handle and what happens when the broom handle gets pushed into the holder is the hammock itself is what's pulling on the arms, causing the arms to get pushed in. At this point there's a lot of force and I'm having to compress that main spring on the arms. And as it compresses, it cams. It, it finds the neutral point and it goes beyond the neutral point. So now the main spring there is actually pushing the handle towards the, you know, the crotch here of the fork. And the, the, the force is balanced between the two main springs and the hammock. So those basically you have kind of a three point hold right there. Now in order to get this back out, we don't have a hammock. So we're relying on the friction, the, the surface friction, the face friction uh, at the front of these arms to pull the arms open. So as we start, I'm, I'm hoping you guys can see this side here. As I start to pull, you can see that gets to a neutral position where that arm, the face of this arm right here, where I'm touching, becomes perfectly in line with the force of, the, of pulling the handle out. And what's gonna happen is, once it's perfectly straight on both sides, the handle's just gonna slide out. So it happens so quickly, once those two faces are basically parallel to each other, the friction just releases and the, and the handle just goes without resetting the arms to this position. So what would happen if I increased the overall length of the hammock is um, we would have a less of a holding power uh, when, it's, when the broom is, is seated. So here's our broom handle, right? And currently I have these hammocks designed to basically go from the midpoint here, right? Right across the center line of the broom. So the hammock goes around here like so. And then that's where the arms start and they kind of go up in an angle like this. If I increase the hammock length so that it came to here, let's say like that, then it's gonna sit more in inward of the, um, the, the handle is gonna sit down into the apparatus more and the arms are gonna force to be at more of an angle. Like this, which seems on the surface like a good thing because you have more force going that way to kind of pushing against the arms to try to keep them or to try to force them to open as you're withdrawing the handle. But it doesn't end up working like that. What actually ends up happening is uh, you just need more force to pass the arms. So when you're trying to get the broom handle out, the arms have to compress further because you can see they're, they're longer in effect. And the, the, so even though you have to push harder to get the broom to seat or to get the broom handle out of it, because the hammock is also longer here, the, uh, the force is lessened. So your holding force, your broom is more likely to slip out and yet it's harder to get in and out. So there really is an optimal length of arm in combination with, um, with hammock length and also that fork spacing has an interplay with the arm length as well. So it's a, it's a balancing act there just to get the, uh, the broom handle to seat. But that's not the problem. That's actually relatively easy to do. The hard part here is to get the broom handle back out and to get the thing to reset. So a 21 millimeter uh, diameter broom handle has a circumference of 66 millimeters. Optimal hammock length I found is 33 millimeters, which is exactly the, the midline. That puts our spring, the bottom of the spring here, or I should say the main spring, right at the midpoint where it's going to grip the most and yet it's not that hard to get it to pass. And we can see right there what's happening. I got it to the halfway point. Those faces are almost parallel to each other and the more unparalleled they get, in other words, as they just start to open up a little bit at the front, the instantly, like it's a parabolic diminishing of friction that happens and so that handle just releases itself instead of continuing to pull Right about here is the position where the gripper wants to pop itself open naturally. You see, I give it just a little bit of a nudge. But from the point where the faces are parallel to each other to that sort of pop open release point, I'm actually having to apply more pressure. And that's because this hammock is being squeezed together as, as the motion goes until this release point right there, that's when the hammock starts to spread open again. Until that point, the hammock is being pinched together. So it's effectively acting like a big leaf spring. So we're actually compressing the leaf spring all the way until there, and that's when the leaf spring gets to release. So in order for this to work, we need the friction of the handle being pulled out 
to um, pull the gripper to about where the arms are, it looks like r roughly 45 degrees when the leaf spring can release itself and reset the gripper. And that's why I started adding these horns or ears to my designs. See on this design, that right there would be the moment where the, um, the faces without the ears, the horns, are, are parallel to each other. But in this case, you have to get to about there before the virtual faces, the like straight line between the horn and the, uh, and the inner spring there, the main spring. So that's kind of the release moment and it just has to go just a little bit past that and it pops itself open. So I am darn close and that little bit past that for parallelism uh, is maybe made up for with this band. Although I gotta say, now that I've done a lot of testing on this, I don't think it's the band that's, um, that's doing anything. I think the functionality of this design comes from the balance that I achieved with the uh, the spring rate and, and and the pressure of the you know the print the number of print walls plus the 92 durometer 92a durometer of the of the TPU along with the design all of that was balanced and this band can be removed. So let's test that out by cutting the band. The actual reason that this worked is because I got the balance of all the forces just right, and that's not something I could have predicted. I'm not doing finite element analysis on this, plus you know the wall thickness of the print and the number of uh, top and bottom layers would also dictate you know spring rate and all that. So uh, it's just it was had to be a trial and error type of thing. This was my design before the band, uh, and this one does not work. It, it, it often stays closed. I think it only opens up once in a while. And you can see the only difference between these two is that this one is about a millimeter longer. So the springs here, the arms, are about a millimeter longer. And in this design here, I'm about a millimeter shorter. And this design doesn't work either, even though this design, I hope you guys can see it on camera, has these white inserts. Actually guys, I think this is gonna be easier to explain in CAD. So taking a look at this ghosted view of the part, this is the gripper, right? And this purple geometry there is um, an insert that I've made out of PLA. And you can see it printing here. I used an M600 command to pause the print when it got to the right height. I slipped the insert in and then I printed over the top of it with more TPU. And that worked quite well uh, to get this insert in there. And the idea behind the insert is it's a rigid, it doesn't flex, it can't compress out of the way. It's kind of like a saloon door from a, from a Wild West, uh, an old, old Western kind of deal. And uh, I do think that this has promised to make an already reliable design just that much more reliable. This is the uh, the rubber band, you know, the band version of the of the geometry that we saw that works so well. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work, you can see I've got the um, the band version, the, the the functional version overlaid here. And I decreased for the saloon door version, I decreased the length of the arms by about a millimeter and a half while keeping the tip of the, um, you can see the tip of the horn or the ear there is, is at the same spot. So I thought that this would work better, but it, it didn't, it stopped working. So it's just very finicky. It's definitely a balancing act. I'm confident that I can get this to work, but I'm going to abandon this whole line. And the reason is that it's too complicated. Keep it simple, stupid, the KISS principle, right? We have eight components to this assembly. Way, way too many. And I kind of knew this when I had the idea, but I wanted to try it out anyway, just for fun. Even before I started to draw this, I already had conceptualized the final version, which you guys already saw in the intro, and here it is. It's just two pieces, true flexure functionality here. You can see the way that I conceptualized this is I kept that, those dots, those were the pivot points from the other design, and this whole face and the hammock, that's all the same. So all the way up to the radius there at the end, at the tip of the ears, the horns there, all of that is the same, and then I just sort of adapted it to this flexure idea. So this being only two pieces no longer violates the KISS principle. That, is, that really lives up to it. I mean, I would love to make it a single piece, but uh, I need a rigid element and I need a flexible element. So there you go. I don't think you can simplify it any more than this. Maybe integrate the spikes off the back so you can just stick it straight into the wall instead of having to use screws. I guess the screws count as two extra pieces there. But yeah, I, I'm really proud of this and the fact that it works, it's just 99% of the time, the broom is gonna be in the holder on the wall. So I wanted to test the longevity of the mechanism. I left the broom in the mechanism overnight and you can see it no longer functions. 
it's got some sort of memory going on. You can see the, the buckled creases on the sides are, are staying there. This is no longer flat, so this is stretched out as well. And yeah, so this is not a suitable material uh, for this mechanism. Maybe there's some sort of a thermo set that doesn't have any memory to it. It always springs back. It doesn't sort of retain. See, there's no forces right now that are causing this to be wrinkled. It's just sort of got the memory of the wrinkles that it was having before. So clearly I'm not gonna be able to be successful making this at home uh, because I can only print with TPU. Maybe there's some other wonder thermoplastic that I don't know about that wouldn't do this, but yeah, this was a fun exercise, but it's just not viable as a useful mechanism. Not in its current state anyway. Um, this is ready for injection molding and you can injection mold thermoset plastics. And thermoset plastics are like, think of epoxy resin where you mix two components together and after a little while they harden and if you heat them up again, they don't melt. You can't reform them. They're, they're set in their shape forever. So those don't have the same memory that this has. Basically, thermoplastics are kind of always able to move. They're always at some level molten. So room temperature is just kind of more frozen than being pressed through the, the, the nozzle of your 3D printer. So that's why this thing deforms when it's been sitting under pressure for quite a while. Think of this as basically just an extreme case of creep. So we know about plastic creep as affecting the, uh, the properties of our other prints, but that's what's going on here, yeah. So not viable, 3D printed, absolutely a fantastic proof of concept and can be viable if made with the injection molded process with a different type of flexible plastic there. All right, so I'm gonna post this up on Thangs and I wanna mention Chris who developed the original copy. He was just copying the commercially available version like this and I used his files as a rough scaffolding to completely redesign that part into what you're seeing here. And then of course you saw all of the iterations that I went through, this, this stack of, of parts here um, to develop this. Um, anyway, he is, you know, he's, he's been in contact with me and, and uh, he's got a small, small YouTube channel. Like he's just starting out in this, in this game. And uh, I thought I'd give him a shout out because he made a fantastic video today about another type of flexure that he's created along with an instruction set for how to get um, multiple component assemblies posted up on Thangs. And it's a really neat functionality that the Thangs website has. So well worth the watch. Check in the description for that video. And that'll do it for this video. Humongous thank you, as always, to my Patreon supporters. You guys make the channel possible. Without you guys, I would have quit making videos a long time ago. Uh, yeah, enough said. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.